It's the call up. It is October 6th, the Thursday. It's a dead baseball day. We have basically <laughs> nothing going on besides the Arizona Fall League, which is nice. Uh, I've been trying to keep up with that. Obviously, once we're done running down this entire top 100 list, we'll be giving you a lot of that Arizona Fall League coverage. But of course, I'm Aram Layton. He's Jack McMullen in a very zipped up Ball State jacket right now. Can you breathe in that? There you go. Yeah, let that thing go. Jack, how are we doing? I'm good, man. Now that I unzipped my jacket just a little bit, I'm feeling good. Yeah, I figure you can breathe now. Is it, is it cold in Indy or are you just going for the look today? Uh, no, it's a little cold in Indy. I uh, I just drove a lot. Like it was an early morning and you know, like early morning, you tend to just like want to, you know, cuddle up in whatever you can. Um, this is not a blanket type environment right now recording a podcast. So I was thinking, you know what, let's just get the hoodie nice, nice and snug. Dude, I kind of wish you had a blanket instead, but we're, we're talking 40 through 21 here in the top 100 list. And then we're going to probably aim for Monday for the final, you know, 20 prospects there where, you know, we're going to spend a lot of time talking about each of those guys, probably go a, a pretty long time there on each of them and, and really make the case, especially for the top 10. But, you know, we start at 40 here and now, now it's almost like we're getting to that final countdown where, it really gets to the point of maybe not quite elite, elite prospects. I don't want to say like blue chip, but we're getting to that 55 plus future value range where it's just a lot more all-stars here. And of course, there's going to be guys that we talked about already in the last 60 that are going to be all-stars, but these are the guys that we're projecting as all-stars. We're getting closer and closer to, you know, those types of players. What I will say though, is the irony in it is we're starting with somebody that, even if he doesn't make a single all-star game could be one of the more valuable all around players. And it's someone that you got to see recently. And I'm really glad you got to see a little bit of him. It's Andy yeah. Rodriguez catching prospect also plays second, first left field and wherever else you want to stick him. And he's a switch hitter with the Pittsburgh pirates. Uh, he was our minor league hitter of the year. <laughs> so, and we've talked about him so much. We don't need to really set the scene as much of, you know, what makes this guy so good offensively. I think we, we've kind of talked about that. I'd rather focus on one, what you saw in person, uh, being able to see this guy play, what, five games at least or or close to that? Yeah, I saw him play six. Okay. So I'm play six. Seeing him play six games. And then also just talking about where he stacks up with the rest of these prospects, because 40 for us, unless I'm missing something, that's the highest in the industry by a good margin. Yeah. And, you know, we're not always the first to just jump and push guys up, but when we're sold on something, we're going to do it. And this is one of those cases. Yeah. I mean, what he did this year was like unmatched, right? The only other guy that had an argument for minor league hitter of the year was probably Matt Mervis. And, yeah. and Mervis is what, three years older than him? Yep. So he plays first base. <laughs> yeah, and he plays first base. Like Andy is not only a really good defensive catcher, but this guy and how smooth he is at the plate, like just working through and at bat, he doesn't need to see very many pitches. Like if he gets a first or second pitch that he loves, he can put a great swing on it. He can also hang around and put a great swing on a 3-2 pitch. Um, I think we just saw a, a guy that is advanced beyond his years. Like 39 doubles, 25 homers, 95 driven in. And oh, by the way, he hit 323 this year. Yeah. You shouldn't be able to be that good in terms of just hit accumulation and power while being a serviceably fast, great defensive catcher. Like he is, he's kind of like Gabby Moreno if Gabby Moreno was a couple years behind in his progression, right? Yeah. Exactly. And, and that's why Moreno is so, you know, highly regarded is, is how young he is, who, by the way, just had his first career big league home run. Congratulations to him. And it was kind of a flash from Moreno of, of the power that's there, right? We haven't seen him consistently tap into it, but he goes right center on a slider, you know, backside in cold weather it kind of shows you the kind of power he has, but similar to Moreno is Rodriguez. He's not going to hit the ball, you know, 111, 112 miles an hour off the bat. Like he does have, above average power he does put up slightly above average exit velos but what's so amazing with Rodriguez is his feel to just lift the ball uh, he does not hit the ball on the ground very often it's not straight fly balls it's line drives and then when he gets an opportunity to try to lift the ball and do damage to his pull side he will and he has a really good comfort in doing so and that's where you see the home runs but what else stands out to me man is 
the fact that this kid at 22 years old is so consistent with the swings from both sides. He used to have a little bit of a different leg kick and uh, from the left side versus the right side, but he's kind of smoothed that out from both sides, simplified it to a toe tap, does it the same way from both sides. You look at the left-handed swing, 1,000 OPS from the left side. You look at the right side, a 975 OPS. I mean, w- what else do you want from a switch hitter? And then I think people really are overlooking the defense, which is what blows my mind. We're talking about one of the best offensive seasons in all of the minor leagues across three levels, 323, 407, 590 slash line. But it's not like he's some nobody catcher that you're trying to figure out what his position is going to be. He plays a good defensive catcher. He continues to get better in that regard. And he plays multiple positions. How is this guy not a consensus top 50 prospect? I'm not sure. I I have, I, I guess the only way that he's not a consensus top 50 prospect is if you do believe that this was like his true breakout campaign and you need to see one more, but by June of next year, he'll be a Pittsburgh pirate. Yeah, and if right? you're looking for one more, I mean, he hit 294 last year with an OPS just under 900 in low A. So this guy has been really good. He got really, really good this year. And, and I do think that he's got all-star capabilities here. And, uh, I, I think Pirates fans are going to think about it at the end of next year. Like, who are the guys that we hold on to for 15 years? Is yeah. it a key Brian Hayes? Is it an O'Neill Cruz? Is it, I don't know, like w- one of these arms that's coming up? Or is it an Andy Rodriguez? And right now it looks like Andy might be the most valuable piece for the Pittsburgh Pirates. Which is crazy to say. And the last thing I'll say on him before we move on, and we knew we are going to spend a couple extra minutes on Andy versus, you know, many of the other people we're going to talk about here, just, you know, because of the reasons that we've just been, uh, you know, so drawn towards his game. 86% zone contact to go with the ability to lift from both sides of the plate. And, and then all the defensive tools that come with that, a $10,000 international free agent. I will always pound the desk and say, Go quali- quantity over quality when it comes to international free agents because you have no idea what these 15, 16 year olds are. Go with as many international free agents as you can. If I was in charge of a team, I would 100% do that. And Andy Rodriguez is another example of that. Uh, the other thing, too, is it's our job to inform you which players are going to make an impact at the big league level before they get to the big league level. And if we're going to wait until he's doing it at the big league level, then we're not doing our job properly. And I'm willing to take the chance and put myself on the record of saying this guy is a very clear cut top 40 prospect. And I probably could have pushed him higher, but ultimately I didn't want to be too ridiculous from the rest of the industry, but I I probably could have talked myself into pushing him even higher, but 40 is a very good spot for him given that, you know, we were probably the only ones that even had him on the top 100 coming into this year. So really excited with what Andy's done and very, very pumped to see what he does next year. Yeah, 100 percent, man. Um, no, I, I think Andy's going to be spectacular. And whether we have him for two weeks or two months, I'm incredibly excited to have Andy Rodriguez in Indianapolis. Next up, we got Hunter Brown and Hunter Brown has got to be, you know, one of the more surprising prospects for me this year, just because. And Houston Astros, I should say, just because when you look at what Hunter Brown ha- has done versus where he was before this and the profile and, and everything that we've seen. And by the way, for those watching on YouTube, I'm going to scroll back to Andy Rodriguez real quick so you can see the grades there. It's 60 present on the hit tool and then above average across the board, basically everywhere else with a 70 future on the hit tool. But going back to Hunter Brown here, I mean, what he has done this season is just nothing shy of incredible, not just in the minor leagues, not just in the fact that he started in triple a and, and just absolutely put it all together, but then it's gone up to the big leagues and had to be this Swiss army knife of some sorts, because that's what happens when you're the top prospect, a big league ready prospect for an organization, for a team that is trying to win a title. I mean, they're going to put your development second in that case. And I'm not saying they're stunting his development by any means, but you know, in any other circumstance, you're putting Hunter Brown out there every fifth day and seeing how much you can stretch him out. That's not the case with the Astros right now. And he has been that Swiss army knife for him when he needs to start. He's been great. He's used that four pitch mix really well. And I've written a piece on that on just baseball.com. If you're interested in seeing the way his arsenal tunnels so effectively off of itself, I broke that all down with video and everything because he has that plus fastball, which is mid nineties with a ton of life. Then he has the slider and curveball, both of which are above average to plus. I have a 70 grade on the curveball and a 55 to 60 on the slider. Then he'll mix in the changeup. But when you have this slider just jetting, you know, sweeping across, and then also the curveball biting downwards when you have the riding fastball, it's a tunneling nightmare. And the changeup plays up as well. 
This was a Division II guy, Jack, out of yeah. Wayne State University in 2019. Yeah, Great stuff. It exploded in D2. We know that happens. You find guys like that all the time. But what's been really impressive is the way his mechanics have cleaned up. He looks like a carbon copy mechanics-wise of Justin Verlander, who yes, he's he idolized does. and talked about trying to emulate those mechanics. And we know the Astros were one of the first organizations to fully – adopt the you know cameras from a million different angles let's get your mechanics perfect like that's what the astros do and they did it again with hunter brown yeah so hunter brown is a guy that's listed at 6'3 220 he pitches like he is a lot bigger than 6'3 220 his arsenal the way that he gets some tilt down on the mound the way that he works downhill at you similar to justin verlander verlander pitches beyond his frame hunter brown even though he's got a pretty big frame pitches beyond his frame, which is so enjoyable to watch. I mean, this is a guy that has figured out how to overpower major league hitters as a rookie, and you just don't see that often. And yes, a testament to the Astros and getting the mechanics picture perfect, also a testament to Hunter Brown yep. for taking supreme care of his body. Mm -hmm. It's obvious that this guy has tailored his body to do exactly what he wants on the mound, um, and this is a dude that is decently big that throws like a legitimate big dude and the Astros could use that man I mean they don't really have guys that throw like that you think about their yeah. rotation Verlander throws like nobody we've ever seen before uh, Framber Valdez throws like he's just trying to be crafty and get outs even though it's still 93 Christian Javier is you know slider frame guy that relies on spin that relies on his fingertips more than really anybody else. And Lance McCullers is just going to spin you to death. Um, only other guy I'm missing is Luis Garcia, who just salsa dances on the mound. And that's <laughs> his personality trait. But but Hunter Brown is like, he's that big body bully ball pitcher that the Astros yeah. did not have. No, I, I agree. And, you know, what I love about it, though, is he looked like that big bodied guy that you're like, okay, he's just going to overpower guys. He'll miss his spots, but his stuff's so good that – He'll still get the whiff. That's going to, you know, hold you back from being an ace or a frontline guy, but you could still be a very solid middle to back of the rotation starter. The reason why Hunter Brown is so high for us is what I saw down the stretch of the season in AAA and then even in some of those big league starts. This was a much more polished guy. This wasn't just the bully, overpower you guy. I watched him, especially working with Maldonado. There was once the, his big league debut was just. Uh, just so much fun to watch. I really, if you're going to read one piece on just baseball.com that I've put together of these prospects, I, I would say it's the, the Hunter Brown one. Uh, if we're going to talk about each of these guys, because I had so much fun cutting up that video and showing how he was East West commanding. Like I have not seen from very many prospects that are making their big league debut. And yeah. what was amazing is the way it sets up his arsenal, right? You got a lefty up. I remember it was Corey Seager was up and he goes fastball up and away and dots it at the top outside part of the zone. You know what he does off of that? Now that Seager's thinking about that elevated fastball that he has to start hammer. early on, he hammer. snaps a hammer. And what does Seager do? Swings right over it. Now you got him 0-2. You can do whatever you want. He teases him with another fastball. Seager starts his swing, stops it, and then guess what he does again? Hammer. Aries. Seager swings right over it. It's a tunneling nightmare. He does the same thing with the slider to righties. And then, oh, yeah, by the way, he can still mix in an average changeup. This guy is going to be a number two starter at the big league level. I really do believe it. The only reason why he's not a little bit higher is age. And, you know, I would like to have seen a little bit more track record, you know, and that's why with the pitcher's track record will come a little bit more with it. But I think 39 is, is pretty freaking high for a guy that was not even on our top 100 coming into this year. And I really do think he could be a number two guy. Very safe bet to be a number three guy. I, I don't. I don't think it's crazy to say that this guy has all-star capabilities next year if he gets a shot in mm -hmm. the Astros rotation. Like, I, I think this is a guy – and, I mean, think about it. In, in 20 and a third innings, he's allowed two earned runs in Major League Baseball right now. So he was obviously plug and play. He's like a more powerful George Kirby. And yeah. I, I think the thing that, that unlocks Hunter Brown is probably learning to work off of your misses. And like you're saying, he doesn't miss much. But – yeah. The great pitchers, especially when you have that fastball curveball combination, if he does sail a fastball, can you work a curveball off that? Can you make it look like you don't have the feel and then all of a sudden it just drops into the middle of the strike zone? And I, I think, I think he that's can. the next step. I think, and he, I can think too. he can. Yeah. And, and again, he's in the right organization that just seems to always 
get the most out of their guys, whether it's a rookie or a vet, you know, it, yeah. no matter who it is, they always seem to get them right, especially mechanically. And, and Hunter Brown's mechanics are really fun to watch, which was not the case when he came out of division two Wayne state. Yeah. Checking in at 38. And another really good story this year, man, because it was almost a bad story. And now it has turned into a really pleasant one. And, and I always love being able to, to talk about guys in this light. Josh Young, he checks in at 38. He does technically fall from the preseason rankings only because we were so, 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 so high on him. And then, of course, he goes down with that shoulder injury, which was believed by a lot of people to end his season. He not only makes it back for the Texas Rangers and goes right into AAA and just mashes right off the bat, he gets his way, makes his way up to the big leagues and showed us some really good flashes there. This guy's a good defensive third baseman who has a really good field to hit and good power. I mean, it's just your prototypical third baseman that I think is as safe as they come and a, a big part of the Rangers' future. Yeah, I think so, too. Um, and if I were to power rank people born on February 12th, 1998, I think Young would very clearly slot in in the two spot, surely. Um, only behind is that your truly. birthday? Yeah, that is my birthday. Uh, sure so, that. yeah, we're birthday buddies. Uh, exact same age. Good to note that I am 24 years and 236 days old. Thank you, baseball reference. But <laughs> uh, Josh Young, yeah, man. I mean, he, he comes back um, from this shoulder issue, 23 games in AAA, and he just looks like Josh Young again, yep. which is really impressive. Like you just kind of chalk this up as a lost year. Uh, hey, maybe he could, you know, crack into the lineup in September. But like, let's talk 2023. Let's, you know, kind of just get a head start on the offseason. And that wasn't the case, man. I mean, he came back. He impressed enough to get this, you know, 26 game cameo at Texas. And uh, I think Texas has to be really happy knowing that they've got their everyday third baseman in the lineup opening day next year, barring yep. something, you know, bad happening this off season. Uh, absolutely. And, and to get back from that, you know, that lead shoulder labrum issue to be able to come back and, and not really have that power impacted, still feel, have that loose fluidity to a swing. The bat speed was there. Uh, there's one thing to just focus on with Josh Young. And I don't think it had anything to do with the injury. Um, this is something that's always been kind of, uh, a minor concern for me with him, and it's just something to follow as he develops at the big league level. You look at what he did. He had five home runs in 26 games. That's great. He also walked 4% of the time and struck out 38% of the time. Don't really care because it's a small sample size, but I, I could have predicted. like it, This was something that we talked about uh, when we were talking about his potential promotion. Uh, you even look at what he did in AAA, showed the power, put up great numbers, 4% walk rate, 28% K rate. I'm not actually worried about swing and miss. That's the thing. I'm worried about swing and swing. He swings way too much. And bat to ball wise, he's fine. He's going to be always in the 83, 84% zone contact, make enough bat to ball, just consistency there that it'll be fine. But he chases a lot. And I think that's because you go back to his days at Texas Tech. You remember, Jack, this guy was so fun to watch it because he hit everything. It didn't matter where it was pitched. It didn't matter what the count was, how good the pitcher was. He hit everything. That being said, you get to AAA, you get to the big leagues. Guys will exploit that. And that's what's happening with Josh Young. He's very swing happy. And that's something he's going to have to tone down a little bit, especially as teams game plan for him, right? He's, he's going to be a middle of the order masher. Hopefully that's what you're hoping for. You can't be swinging as frequently as he is 35 to 38% chase rates. Just not going to fly. He swings just way too much just to put it simply. So Major League Baseball could make the switch to BB core bats. And if that's the case, Josh Young can keep on swinging the way he does. Because <laughs> you're right. I, yeah. He was electric, Texas Tech. But like th the ball can fly off those things. So even if you get a bad swing off, that's the big thing. That's the biggest difference between college baseball and, uh, you know, when you see it in these collegiate summer leagues, when they go to the wood bat. The, or The B swings aren't going to play the same way. <laughs> no, the B swings do not play the same way. You look like an idiot with a B swing in yeah. professional baseball. Exactly. So, you know, that's something I think will come. And the fact that he's remained productive despite the aggression, I think, is, is a testament to the bat-to-ball skills. But let's see that approach continue to get better. Other than that, he is a phenomenal offensive prospect here who can play a decent third base. Guess what? We got back-to-back -back Texas Rangers here. Yeah. Coming in at 37 is probably one of the biggest risers as well. An unranked guy coming into this year, and he has shot up all the way to the top 40. Evan Carter, outfield prospect with the Texas Rangers. And he was viewed by many as, as almost a sure thing to go to Duke. And um, I think a lot of people would have told you that they were expecting him to go to Duke. And 
ultimately the Rangers saw something they liked, offered him a little bit over slot. They were able to sign him away uh, and, and get him to come to that organization in 2020. And this is a big dude at 6'4", 190, big as in projectable, not filled out yet, has a lot of room to fill out, but phenomenal field to hit plus runner and has just hit the ground running in professional baseball. The reason why I love Evan Carter as a prospect is we've seen the offensive production already. We've seen the bat to ball translate really as a teenager immediately to low A, high A, and then even in his six games in double A looked really, really good. Uh, what really stands out to me is you have that bat to ball. You have him tapping into power already, and he has way more room to fill out. Yeah, I, I guess the thing that jumps out to me is like, this is this is a name that many people probably haven't heard um, before looking at this list, right? I, like, mm -hmm. This is one of those unknowns that played 32 games in low A before this year, and that was it. That and, was it. and here we are, and you know, yeah, he was really good and he got on base a lot. Um, and, and he, he had game changing speed. I think that was the big thing to highlight here. So in high A, yeah, he had 26 bags, but he also had 10 triples. Um, <laughs> so, so this is a guy that can hit the ball around the ballpark and absolutely fly. He got a taste yeah. of Frisco for six games, final week of the season. Um, I, I think this is a guy that if he does break out in Frisco next year, he can continue to climb because, I mean, 6'4", 190 is a guy fresh out of high school. That ETA at 2024, he might be a lot more filled out and he might have a different game in 2024 when he does make that debut. Absolutely. A question for you, and you might, if you don't know the answer to this, you don't have to make up an answer, but w w what's the environment like in high A for the Texas Rangers? Uh, I that? won't even try making up an answer to that. That's okay. Hickory. Um, the Hickory Crawdads. We, know. we know it's not a launch pad then, right? At least we're pretty sure it's not a launch pad. They're in the Sally League, the South Atlantic League. Like I'm thinking humidity there. Okay. So just for reference here, the reason why I bring that up is so Evan Carter, now he was 19 the entire season. He just turned 20. He hit a ball 445 feet this season in that league. He also hit several home runs well over 400 feet, towering homers that he's also put up 108, 109, I think a few 110 exit velos as well. And he's got probably 30 pounds of muscle he could add. <laughs> so we're, we're talking about a very wiry 6'4", 190 with a lot more room to add. Even if that slows him down a tick, he looks great in center field. He looks like a potential plus defender in center field. That even if he slowed down a step and was more of an above average runner, his reads and routes were so impressive. This is a potential five-tool guy here, Jack. And that's why we have him so high up. And I mean, how often are you seeing guys straight out of the draft that aren't top 10 picks. We're talking about the 2020 draft of, of all of the prep guys. How many of them hit the ground running the way that we really saw Evan Carter just do it? Not only did he hit for power and, and have his speed show and really also show the defense, he also only struck out 17% of the time between mostly high A and a little bit of double A. Chase rate at 18%, doesn't whiff. I mean, this is a safe profile with upside to dream on. That's my favorite thing in the prospect world. Yeah, the, the only – I'm thinking the only recent high school guys that have just hit the ground running like crazy are in the Cardinal system, right, yep. with with Jordan Walker, Mason Wynn, Tank Hats. Yep, and you can go to like, you know, Colson Montgomery. Or, but those are all first-round guys. So it, yeah. it, it, it's it's really interesting to see a prep second-rounder, you know, be able to do this. And I, and I should say I actually misspoke. He was a second-round underslot guy. So he was underslot. probably projected third or fourth round. He was oh. offered $1.25 in the second round, uh, in the early part. And that was technically an underslot for where he was selected. I'd say yes to 1.25. I would say yes to a lot of things for $1.25 million. I, uh, I had a, the Texas uh, Rangers is definitely one of them. I had a high school teammate that said, I will sign for a filet fish sandwich. <laughs> I would too. I, he was not good enough to, to play, uh, professional baseball. It's usually how that works when you're willing to sign for that little, uh, <laughs> We'll go to Gavin Stone. Uh, Gavin Stone has been one of the nastiest pitchers in the minor leagues this season. That's simple. Los Angeles Dodgers, surprise, surprise. Seems like he came out of nowhere uh, and just has been ridiculous. He had a good year last year. Wasn't like off the charts good, but the swing and miss was 
off the charts. Uh, but, you know, we didn't have enough of a sample size, really 70 innings in low A, excuse me, 21 more in high A yeah. as an older guy at that level. But then this year, we got to see him in high A, double A, and triple A. And across those three levels, it was just blatantly comical. A 1480 RA for the right hander, 121 and two thirds innings, 168 strikeouts, 44 walks, only allowed three home runs. And you look at the pitch grades here, and we got a plus on the fastball, we got a plus on the changeup, above average slider, and an average curveball to go with above average command. Uh, this guy's been just, I don't even know what to, like, I'm out of adjectives. What, what would be your adjective for Gavin Stone this year? Uh, no adjective. He was the ERA king in minor league baseball. He had, he had the best ERA by a wide margin in minor league ball. So I, whatever adjective you want to attach to that, like he was the best pitcher in minor league baseball this year. Um, you know, you, you factor in some, some other, um, some other areas, right. And, and we decided that Andrew Painter was our pitcher of the year, yeah. but Gavin Stone, I'm sure was the runner up. Yeah, no, I mean, and it was a tough decision to make, to be honest. Ultimately, you know, what, what set Painter apart was the walks <laughs> or, or the lack thereof. Yeah. When you get to double A as a 19-year-old, and, and we'll talk more about Painter in the final episode, but, uh, you know, when you walk two guys and strike out 37, uh, that's just that's just off the charts, right? Yeah. Gavin Stone's got phenomenal, phenomenal stuff. The command isn't a concern, but it could get a little bit better, right? If we're talking about a guy that just can get away with, you know, maybe – walking a few guys because his stuff's so good like he could walk the first two batters at the ending and then strike out the side that wasn't even something that andrew painter was doing at all no one was even getting on base for andrew painter so that was the difference but i mean gavin stone's going to rectify that it's not even like he's walking a ton of dudes uh but you know it's just something that kind of separated them slightly was just that walk rate but i mean when you strike out 34 percent of batters and you get ground balls at a 48 percent clip simultaneously or 48 percent clip simultaneously you're in pretty good shape yeah, and I mean, you know, you look at other guys in that Dodgers system. Gavin Stone is a more advanced pitcher than Bobby Miller, I think. I yep. think Bobby Miller yep. is better, higher ceiling, but I think Gavin Stone is uh, more developed, like closer to what he's actually going to become. Uh, and, and then the other guy that pre-trade deadline with the Gallo thing w was Clayton Beater that everybody was watching, right? And Beater yep. was a guy that didn't really know where pitches were going very often. And Gavin Stone was the taste breaker from those guys where they would all have short appearances in low A and high A um, and, and Bobby Miller and Clayton Beater were the guys that would light up the radar gun. And that those were the two that you would circle. But last year, Gavin Stone was the guy coming off of a fifth round selection at a central Arkansas. Who is yep. he? And then he puts together a, a pretty good year last year and he starts this year and it's like, Oh wow, this is a serious breakout candidate. Uh, and it turns into legitimacy when he dominates OKC for six starts, too. So Dustin Demeter, a couple months ago, wrote up Gavin Stone when he was in double-A Tulsa. Uh, I want to say this was like late June, early July. Really, really good article. And yeah. so much of it still reigns true today. So if you go to JustBaseball.com and just search Gavin Stone, I'm sure you'll find it. It's the first thing that pops up. Yeah. And one last note on Gavin Stone, because he Dustin did an unbelievable job on that. The changeup, and he talks about it in that article. The changeup was just the way he described it. I was like, okay, I need to rewatch this. And I really watched as much of the changeup as I could. It just literally did the thing where I clicked changeup and queued it all up and just watched a million changeups. Holy crap. <laughs> and if you want to hear the numbers on the changeup real quick, 120, 189, 149 slash line against the changeup with a 52% K rate. And that's throwing it 38% of the time, Jack. 99 strikeouts, 21 hits, three extra base hits on his changeup. Yeah, that's an elite pitch. I don't think I've ever seen that. I, I honestly, the more I think about it, I like probably should adjust this grade and put a 65? 70. I don't 70? know why I put 60. What's wrong with me? Yeah, I, I, my, that one slipped through the cracks. That's a freaking 70 pitch right there. I'll tell you that. Damn, um, okay. All right, we'll move on to the next guy. Man, this is a loaded group of 20, huh? <laughs> 35, Jason Dominguez, outfield prospect of the New York Yankees. You may have heard of him. And we talk about maybe not hearing of Evan Carter. You may have heard of Jason Dominguez. Um, we don't need to spend as much time on him because we've talked about him a lot. I've talked about him without you on the podcast, Jack. We've talked about him with you on the podcast. I've written up 
a whole story about how his swing adjustments have really, you know, taken his game to the next level this year. He got the opportunity to get his feet wet in double A. Everyone was talking about him and Jackson Chorio, you know, getting that little cameo in double. Dominguez looked way better. Yeah, I know he's older, but still, like Dominguez looked way more comfortable. Um, this guy's really good, man. I don't know what to, I don't know what to say other than that. I mean, he really improved all of the concerns I had adjusted his swing drastically the reads in the outfield got way better which was a big concern too uh, I think he he kind of shedded some of the unnecessary weight and looks like a little bit more quick which has helped him too and he talked about that as well because that was a big concern for me too I'm like oh well, we're celebrating this guy's speed I'm worried he's going to topple over when he's trying to round a bag he looks a lot better in that regard too uh, this guy improved every issue that there was like every concern he said oh, okay I'll, I'll get I'll, I'll take care of that and he took care and of Oh, all. by the way, don't ever forget that he was born in February of 2003. Uh, I try to forget that. He's 19 years old, dude. I, we've been Somehow we have prospect fatigue about a 19-year-old. Yep. <laughs> yep. And he's already changed his build as a prospect. Uh, not only has he changed his body, like you're saying, but I mean, the swing, like... Remember that that video of the swing that that you sent me when you went and saw him in Tampa, where he followed through with his backhand, and it just it was the most disgusting thing ever. Yeah. And, and yeah. here we are, and I'm not going to say it's a smooth swing, but it's a hell of a lot smoother than it once was. It's I all think he, re- yeah, and he's slugging more now. I I think he's realizing that he doesn't need to swing out of his shoes and out of his uniform in order to impact the ball effectively and and i think he's going to be a very very well-rounded baseball player i mean these are the two figures that stand out the most to me jack and and you know we we see the tangible adjustment with the swing his chase rates dropped by 10 percent. his whiff rate in the zone dropped by seven percent you do those two things you're generally going to be in very good shape and oh yeah by the way he's also hitting the ball as hard as he ever has to so you cut the whiff you cut the chase and you hit the ball harder. I'm usually willing to bet that those three things will lead to better production. And guess what it did? It led to a 278, 381, 476 slash line across the three levels. But really, he got better as the year went on. And if you look at the numbers in high A, that was really indicative of the hitter. I think we can get used to seeing more patient, less strikeouts. And, you know, the power is not a make or break aspect of his game when he's like this. By the way, in high A, 17 for 18 on stolen bases. Um, that th- this is a much more well-rounded player that is, you know, kind of settling into the player he was supposed to be. I can't wait for the headline from the New York post. Is the Martian going to break camp with the New York Yankees? Oh yeah. We're getting that one this year. I'm sure. Wow. And it, the answer is no. <laughs> the answer is no. Uh, let the guy, let the kid freaking develop, please. Um, 34, somebody that should break camp with the Rays next year. And, you know, I thought, you know, maybe we should have saw at some point this year, Curtis Meek. Curtis Mead of the Tampa Bay Rays third base prospect, but can play a little bit all over. And I'm very interested to see what the Rays long-term plans are with Mead. You and I saw him in Biloxi. And you know, this is not somebody like Jason Dominguez that's going to like turn your head. But if you get a chance to watch him for five, six, seven games, you're going to be like, wow, I want that guy on my ball club. Because what does he do? He hits, he hits, he hits. He doesn't strike out. He walks. And he's able to move around the diamond, even though he doesn't excel in any defensive position. He can play a passable third base. He can play first base. You can throw him in left field. Then you can get even a, get away with second if you really needed him to. But most likely a third base, first base kind of guy. Uh, and the bat is really the calling card here. I think he has a lot more power than people give him credit for. And he's a big dude. He, he really is a big dude. It's, and has continued to add strength and impact. And I think it's really important to note here He's still 21 years old. He just put up a phenomenal double and triple A season here as a 21 year old after just putting up a phenomenal season last year as a 20 year old between low A and high A. This guy's just kind of born to hit. Yeah. And almost identical slugging, almost identical OPS between 2021 and 2022. 226 games in his minor league career. He's slashing 306, 376, 517. And, And I think that's, what you can expect from Curtis Mead at the major league level. What comes like, so he punched out 62 times in 76 games. Do you see a teensy bit more swing and miss coming at the big league level or what? I, I honestly 
don't think he's going to strike out that much, man. I, I, I think, you know, maybe a little bit more like any player. I think there is a little bit of like a little bit of zone whiff. He's not, you know, going to be that, that bat to ball, like Sal Freelich type of guy. But I think the strikeouts are always going to be in the 20% range, you know, 20 to 22% range, but he has such a good approach. And, and that's what really stands out to me. And also, you know, he's able to get to tough pitches. His plate coverage is really impressive while also being able to turn on stuff on the inside part of the plate. I think what stands out the most to me, Jack, is the power. You know, that's that's the thing that really stands out to me is I think people are always saying, you know, hit over hit over power, hit over power. And I think he he is somewhat of that guy, but he hits the ball freaking hard. He's posted 112, 113 mile per hour exit velos, a 90th percentile ex- exit velo of 106.7, which is elite. And oh yeah, by the way, great approach. So yeah. I, I think there's always going to be a little bit of swing and miss and he might end up being settling in more into that corner masher which is okay because he's already shown to have the bat to ball. He adds the power. If that comes with a little bit of whiff, I'm okay with that because I'm, I'm confident that he will always keep the strikeout rate below 25%. I just dare someone to find me the weakness in his game from watching any game from the last two years of Curtis Mead. It's, it's impossible to locate. Oh, well, this is a glaring issue. Yeah. Do do you know what he did to lefties this year? Uh, no. I, I like had to to triple check this because I, I couldn't believe it. Between double and triple A this year against left-handed pitching, 388, 430, 688 with a 300 ISO. That's an 1118 OPS, 14% K rate. <laughs> I mean, so we're talking about the floor here is lefty demolisher. But the yeah. thing is, against righties, he's still at an 850 OPS. So I, that's something to watch. You know, like you know, how much are those splits going to be the way they are? But even if they are that way, okay, he can move all over the infield. You know, he dismantles lefties, and it's not like he's you know bad against righties. That's going to continue to get better. And remember, he's 21 years old. So very excited about Curtis Mead, and just another one of those hit first prospects that the Rays always seem to just buy low on. They got him away from the, the Phillies for a quadruple A pitcher. And yeah. you know, look, look at where he's at now with, with the Rays, a big part of their future, I think. So everyday player where his off days come against right-handed stars. Yep. Occasionally. If it's like, you know, nasty, hard throwing guy that, you know, maybe he's, you got a better option than that. Sure. But yeah. I, that's somebody that's going to really be a, a valuable piece for the Rays who love to mix and match in that manner. Yeah. 33. Miguel Vargas, very similar profile, I think. I think you look at Meade, a little bit more power. Vargas, a little bit more bat to ball. Uh, Vargas, third base prospect, Los Angeles Dodgers. We finally got to see him at the big league level this year. I wish they called him up sooner. I don't know what his role is going to be in the in the postseason. But, I mean, this is a prospect that I have loved for a very, very, very long time. You've been hearing me talk about him for probably forever. Yeah. You, you, what you said with Curtis Mead could ring true, I think, even more so with yeah, Miguel Vargas. Weaknesses. Find me a problem. Uh, defensively, sure, maybe he doesn't excel there, but he plays another guy that can play third, second, first, left, whatever you need. So if he's going to be a slightly below average or average defender, at least he can do it at a lot of positions. Was not the debut that, you know, I think the Dodgers were hoping for. That's okay. A lot of guys struggle through their first 50 plate appearances. Not really going to draw much from that because – I would tell you, if you're concerned about that, he's 22 years old. And why don't you look at each of the last five minor league seasons or four, whatever they are, and since he started uh, you know, professionally. He has hit at every single stop, every single yeah. stop. Last year, 21-year-old in high A and double A, well over 300 batting average, well over 370 on base percentage, slugged at well over a 500 clip, 23 homers, and just did a little bit of everything. You look at the WRC plus in high A, 142. Gets to double A, 141. Then this year, spends the whole year in triple A. Absolutely mashes again. 304, 404, 511. 17 home runs, 16 stolen bases. Struck out less than 15% of the time. This is safe of an offensive profile as you're going to find. So what I will say, just to push back that he has hit at every level, um, (laughs) Miguel Vargas in 2014, in the winter of 2014, 2015, with Industriales de la Habana, um, he hit 115 in eight games. He was teammates with both of the Guriels, Yuli and Lourdes Guriel. A 30 year old Yuli, a 20 year old Lourdes. Miguel Vargas was 14 years old. Um, I think it was probably time to write him off at that point. Can you can you believe that he was so like advanced for his age? 
he was 12 playing. and a half years younger than the average hitter in the Cuban League, <laughs> the Cuban <laughs> National Series at that point. A 14 year old. 14 year old in the Cuban National Series. Playing with a 30 year old. Imagine Yuli Guriel and Miguel Vargas's interactions. 30 year old playing with a 14 year old. Like, was Yuli like, oh my God, I'm an old fart. I got to get stateside now. I just, I, 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 we got to dig up some old footage of that. Oh, he's I need absolutely. to find a 14 year old Miguel Vargas, you know, <laughs> right behind Guriel in the lineup and, and just what that looks like. I mean, that's a testament. This kid was born to hit, right? So I mean, this kid was born to hit. We're going to get active with like the short form video content over the yes. off season. I know you were talking about wanting to do something on that 2015, 2016 Florida team. Yeah. I think I'm going to do something on a lot of these guys playing in leagues when they were like 14, 15 years old, whether it be like the Dominican winter league or the Venezuelan winter league um, or the Cuban national series and just yeah. who their teammates were 14 year old Miguel Vargas with 30 year old Yuli Gurriel. Dude, I, I actually love that idea. I'm going to yeah. like mentally store that because follow our YouTube or subscribe to our YouTube um, this off season. We're going to be doing a lot of those like live bookends with hitters as well, going through their yeah. old at bats. We've done it with Matt Mervis, Alec Burleson, Joey Weimer. Uh, that's already on our YouTube channel, but you know, for those that are listening to the podcast, we're going to do a lot more of those 10, 15 minute like dives into things you might not know about, like a 14 year old Miguel Vargas playing with the Guriel brothers uh, and short form videos like that, that we're very excited about. Uh, Before we move off of Miguel Vargas, I do have a quick take for you. Um, okay. I just think it's time to move off of Justin Turner. I think Miguel Vargas yeah. should be the third baseman for the Los Angeles Dodgers in 2023. I agree. I agree. And, you know, this is something that, you know, I think he's earned at this point. Look, I know the 50 plate appearances. I don't really care. Uh, he got his, you know, taste. He's going to go into the off season, knowing what his issues were this and those 18 big league games where he played all over, by the way. And I think next year he should be the guy that, that kind of takes the reins of the hot corner moving forward. I a hundred percent agree with you there. Cool. Let's go to another player who I think ultimately moves to that corner. And this was a little bit lower than I think the industry. And it's Noel V. Marte at 32, Cincinnati Reds. Um, Marte is really good, man. I, I, and I hope this isn't like, this is just one of those things where it's like, he's subjectively low or like relatively low. Um, and people are like, they're like, oh, well, why do you hate Marte? I don't hate him. He's the 32nd ranked prospect in baseball. He's really good. Uh, I, I look at the guys ahead of him who we'll talk about and. And, and some of the limitations for me, we've talked about it in the, in the red system rundown. He's going to move off a short, in my opinion. So, you know, that, that's, that is something that counts against you. The approach, I think, can get exposed in the upper levels. I think it's part of the reason why we didn't see him in the upper levels. You'd look at the numbers this year and you'd assume like, oh, hey, we should, we should see this guy in double A. Yeah, we, we really didn't. Uh, I think that kind of tells you something, right? I mean, why did he need to play all 100 and? 15 games in high A this year, even after the trade between the two organizations. I'm surprised Seattle didn't bump him up in 85 games. And then I'm surprised that Cincinnati didn't bump him up in those 30 games. The bat to ball is really impressive. The power raw power is very impressive, but he has a lot to learn. I think in terms of approach and very pull happy, very swing happy. He gets away with it because of how freaking talented he is. But I would, I'm, I am concerned with that ridiculous pull rate, the way he likes to be out and around the baseball, that when he starts seeing good sliders, when he starts seeing hard stuff running in, it might be a little bit more difficult for him. But this guy has big-time offensive upside. Yeah, the Spanish national team star in the World Baseball Classic yeah. qualifiers. Noel V. Marte from the Dominican Republic playing for Team Spain, which uh, I, I'm struggling to find the correlation here. Why do you hate <laughs> Noel V. Marte? <laughs> um, no, I mean, like the way that I think we looked at it was stacking shortstops. And then once we realized where Noel V. Marte stacked among shortstops, it was, you know, trying to slot him in appropriately within this top 100. Yeah. And as we move forward, I think that we both, particularly you, feel very strongly that the guys that we have ahead of him are better than Noel V. Marte. Yeah. And that's the conversation that you and I had, right? Was okay. This feels slightly low for Marte, but let's go. Let's, let's, let's list off all the other shortstops. <laughs> and which one of these guys are you taking Marte over? And you know that's ultimately kind of what what got him in this spot here. That said, bat to ball really impressive. Like I said, Exavilos impressive. Uh, he's one adjustment away from being a top twenty guy. But I've been waiting for this adjustment now for a full season, and we didn't get to see him get to double A. Uh, again, I think there's a reason why the defense hasn't improved, but I will say a little bit quicker, which is nice. And I think he's going to be able to sprinkle in those stolen bases. 
And again, the, the bat to ball is impressive and the approach has gotten better in terms of not chasing. Now can the approach get better in terms of what you're trying to do with your swings? That's what we'll have to wait and see. So game 162 of 162 in the 2024 MLB season for the Cincinnati Reds. Let's just work around the diamond. Um, Tyler Stevenson catching. Yep. Spencer steer at first, assuming full health. Steer yeah. at first, India at second, Ellie De La Cruz at short, Marte at third. Yeah. Uh, McLean in center. I like McLean in center. Um, or or if Ellie, for whatever reason, doesn't quite progress at shortstop, I like McLean to play short. But ultimately, you're hoping Ellie plays short. Yeah, so McLean and, in center. And then whoever the hell in the corners, right? Yep. Yeah. yeah, you can go sign one corner guy and then, you know, Christian and Carnassi on strand at DH, or if one of them doesn't pan out, you know, flip-flop. That's not even considering Edwin Arroyo and, and some of these other guys that they have in the system. It's silly. Yeah. It's a good system, man. 31. Colson Bad system, Montgomery. man. <laughs> Bad system, man, but good player. Shortstop, Chicago White Sox. I'm I'm really high on this guy. And, um, you know, I – I, I was curious what what your thoughts were because I know you're a White Sox guy. You monitor them maybe a little bit more closely. And I know you were extremely excited about what we were seeing from Montgomery. And then, you know, we don't need to get too much into Project Birmingham. We've talked about it on the podcast. <laughs> so I think most people know what the deal is there. And uh, really forced to, to double A. We talked about how Marte, I would have loved to see him in double A. I, or I would have been fine not seeing Colson Montgomery in double A. <laughs> but ultimately, we see him fast tracked up there. And, uh, you know, it just wasn't the right move. But let's just ignore that. I think you really should ignore the double A numbers because he had no business being there and it was a rush. Look at what he did in, in low A and high A as a prepster, 22nd overall pick by the White Sox last year. Another dude, by the way, 6'4", room to fill out and already flashed really impressive bats of ball skills and some power. Uh, how excited are you for, for the White Sox and, and for what you saw from Colson Montgomery this year? Yeah, no, it's exciting because I'm not sure where he slots in in the long-term plans, and that's okay um, because I, I think the bat's going to take him there. And what was so great to see was he didn't strike out much at all. He walked a lot. This guy screamed 400 OBP before he got to double A. And he was a young guy surviving and thriving at the lower levels of the minor leagues, even when he was, you know, well below the average age of hitters at those levels. So yeah, double A is going to like skew the numbers. I think um, if you want to look at the numbers as a whole on the year, they're, they're kind of indicative of what he can do. But what I will say is it's really impressive to see a teenager, a 20 year old walk as much as he does. Yep. Um, yep. Because the power is going to come with puberty ending for him. It's not over yep. yet. Promise. Uh, He's going to add a lot more weight. He's going to add more good weight. Um, but if you already have the discipline there, he was thrown into the fire, and, and he was fine in the fire. You, you talk about the hit tool, the approach, and those things way ahead of the curb there. Nine or 89% zone contact, Jack. I mean, that's that's really impressive for a 6'4 first-year player. You know, I mean, that, that is extremely impressive. And you talk about the power. He put up a 112 mile per hour exit velo this year, and he's got room. You talk about the puberty. He's got room to fill out. He's going to get stronger. I see plus raw power here. He could be a plus raw plus hit tool guy, which you combine those two. There's very few guys that have that combination. And usually the guys that do are top 20 prospects. Yeah. Damn, man. I mean, he should be the one that White Sox fans are excited about. He and Colas. I, I think that after he and Colas, it gets pretty dark, but you know what? <laughs> Latch on, baby. Yeah, those two are, are looking really good and honestly have a higher chance of translating, I think, than a lot of other prospects, which is good news when your system is not great. Yeah. Bobby Miller checks in at 30, and this guy throws fuzz. We talked about Gavin Stone. Here's another Dodgers prospect that just edges him out. You've been you know, seeing Bobby Miller throw since he didn't throw as much gas, and now we're seeing him throw – more 100 mile per hour fastballs than anybody in the minor leagues. And actually, if I tweeted this, you know, a week or two ago, his average fastball velocity at 99.1 miles per hour would have led all qualified major league starters. Throws fuzz. He's a guy that takes exceptional care of his body. And it was so 
hard to (laughs) – I saw Bobby Miller in 2018 after his freshman year at Louisville. He was out in Brewster when I was in Brewster. And this was a a pretty lanky kid. Um, When he was drafted, he was popping out of his jeans. The way that he attacked the weight room – um, and I, I haven't heard like anything anecdotally about the, who he is in the weight room, but um, the, the way that Todd McShay put it about Will Levis, who's the quarterback for Kentucky, yeah. said he's a weight room legend. I feel like <laughs> Bobby Miller is a weight room legend. Yeah. And, and that's a pitcher that's like, you know what? Move the fuck over. I'm about yeah. to deadlift 600 pounds. <laughs> Let's go. And, and I mean, you, you can see it with his yeah. mechanics, how how powerful he is. Uh, lower half is explosive, and again, it's ninety nine, and it's not like it's it's high effort ninety nine. No. It, it's it's pretty easy, and and hit triple digits. I want to say more than a hundred and something times this year. Like it, it's ridiculous to average ninety nine on your fastball is silly. Uh, and this was as he was being stretched out more this year, right? They didn't baby him as much. The other thing that I love about Miller is he's got the two fastballs, right? He's got the two seamer, he's got the four seamer, and he gets a lot of ground balls, 51% ground ball rate to go with the whiffs that he gets. And then a four pitch arsenal here, which all of them are above average, three potentially plus pitches. And he only walked 8% of batters. There's a potential ace, right? There's a potential ace that you're hoping can kind of follow in the footsteps of Walker Bueller here. Uh, is that crazy to say? No, it's not. It's not crazy at all to say. And um, I, th- I think that Bobby Miller's, the, the slider is as good as Walker Bueller's, I think. The curveball, I would lean towards it being 55 in the future, but the fact that he can throw four pitches and work off of the fastball that is going to be objectively great is is very impressive. Again, higher ceiling than Gavin Stone, much, much higher ceiling than Gavin Stone, but I feel like Stone is just a teensy bit more seasoned at this point. I think there are going to be a couple outings where Bobby doesn't have one or two of those pitches, and we'll see how he fares, but... I think he's always going to have the fastball. And if you always think that fastball, fastball. if he doesn't fare well, okay. Like that's what I see with, with Sandy Alcantara is like, even when the the slider isn't there or the changeup isn't there, he just goes off of the the four seamer and the two seamer and just can can take care of guys with those two pitches alone almost. And I think people forget that Bobby Miller is six, (laughs) five. He's He's big. He's a massive guy build to Sandy Alcantara. Like that's the craziest part about it. I think he's a bit beefier. Well, Okay. Great. <laughs> Sandy's carved like Adonis. Um, yeah, I know, I know. I, know. I, think, I think if but Sandy, I'm saying like 6'5", they're both 6'5". Yeah, if Sandy is acai bowls, Bobby Miller is steak and whole potatoes uncooked. And both both sound interesting. Yeah. Um, okay, we go to 29. <laughs> I don't even know how to conceptualize that in a way that it actually applies here, but I'm sure people listening totally, that resonated with at least a certain amount of people. Um, 29. Jackson Holiday, he's good. He's pretty good, but you know, looks were limited. Obviously, um, you might have heard of him as the number one overall pick in 2022 for the Baltimore Orioles. You might have heard of his dad, uh, Matt Holiday, who was actually at the the Cardinals' final home game this year. It was cool to see him. Got a nice ovation at, at Bush Stadium for the you know ceremony of Albert Pujols and Yanni Molina. Uh, Matt Holiday looks like he could still wield a bat. And Jackson Holiday looks like he could probably still wield uh, a binder for his seventh grade class, but he is big and he is strong and he's only going to get stronger. And I was really impressed with the swing. I think that was the thing that stood out to me, even at the limited low A looks, complex looks, whatever I saw swing is so nice already tapping into some impact there. Um, And the, the tools at shortstop impressed me as well. He's going to stay there and he's got wheels. This is a five-tool potential player here with a left-handed bat at shortstop. I mean, there's a lot to dream on. It's very obvious why he was the number one pick, I think. Yeah, I, I haven't seen really any video of, of his pro ball. I just watched any accessible video pre-draft. And uh, what I will say is if if Bobby Miller is a weight room legend, Jackson Holiday is a high school baseball legend. Is he the greatest high school baseball player ever? He's got to be one of. Has to be. Yeah. Joe Maurer. I think yeah, John Hour like yeah. struck out twice in four years or something like that. Wasn't Josh Hamilton like a high school legend? Oh, too? I'm sure he was. That guy was born to hit. I, I I've heard a story about Josh Hamilton. I think I told it on the call up. Apparently, uh, you know, he like there was a batting practice or something. Like scouts were there to watch his high school BP, and then he put a T on home plate and was just hitting balls 400 dead center off a T. <laughs> I totally believe it, dude. <laughs> that guy was one of the best prospects we've seen. 
Um, holidays pr- pretty pretty special, man. I, the one thing I'll say, I watched a couple videos. Uh, again, we only had twenty games to work with here, and then whatever was accessible from high school. Yeah, there was a couple specific swings. One in particular that really stood out to me. I believe it was his first career double, and it was a pitch on the outer half that he was behind in the count. He goes backside and just beats both outfielders into the gap. And I'm like, okay, if he's already doing this at 18 and low a backside oppo double on a line, uh, he's, he's got juice. Right. And then you look at the approach, small sample size, but the guy walked, what was it? He walked 25 times and struck out just 12 times between the complex and low a uh, for, for a young kid, number one overall pick that's, you know, maybe trying to make some noise, trying to do things. He just seemed like the at bats. He didn't seem rushed. Everything seemed slow. He seemed very comfortable. And then again, I, I was really lucky that I got to get some good looks at him at shortstop arm plays great carry on the throws. He's sticking it short. Again, I really do think he's a five tool shortstop by the time it's all said and done. He is going to be a top 15 prospect in baseball by the end of next season as well. I, re- I really do believe that. Man, how about that? We'll see him in 2026. <laughs> <laughs> I think I think he beats that ETA, I'll be honest. I really do. But I'm starting to realize, like, okay, 2022 is over. 2023 will be his first year, really. 2025 is probably a more realistic ETA, but it, it's so hard when it's this early for these guys. Um, 28. Gavin Williams. And we just put out the all MILB teams on just baseball.com. And I think you did the Gavin Williams write up for the Cleveland guardians, right? Big right hander, nasty. I mean, you've got a chance to, to kind of, I know you like to monitor your guardians prospects. Um, Gavin Williams, I know has probably been one of the best arms out of last year's draft class. I think has been the best arm out of last year's draft class. And I mean, what are you feeling now at, on this guy at a ECU late bloomer that just continues to get better and better? I think he's absolutely incredible. Um, I, I think that he's a big guy at 6'6", 225. I think that he uses the entirety of his frame. Um, and I think that Gavin Williams has a chance to be an all-star several years in a row for the Cleveland Guardians. And what they have done is develop this stable that lines up with the window. And, and we talk often about, yeah, stockpiling prospects and how good the Cleveland Guardians are at stockpiling prospects. But what they did, they absolutely hammered international free agency in 2016 and 2017. Hammered it. And they got guys like Rokio, they got guys like Valera, they got guys like Tana, they got guys like Young Kensi Noel. Um, and now all those guys are knocking on the door and making their debuts. Bo Naylor just made his debut at, at the end of uh, this season. So the position players are all coming up right now. And you pair that with a pop-up guy like Quan and a pop-up guy like Will Brennan. Oscar Gonzalez was another international free agent guy during that time. So what do you do with this gluttony of position player talent that is ready to go and ready to contend starting in 2023, even though we think that they can get as deep as the ALCS this year? Yep. You get a lot of college pitchers. And over the last couple of years, the Cleveland Guardians have been utterly sensational at drafting college pitchers. I'm going to work backwards because this year they went and got Parker Messick and Dylan DeLucia, who is the College World Series most outstanding player. Let's talk last year, what they did in the draft. Gavin Williams was their first round pick. Second round pick was Doug Nikhazy out of Ole Miss, who put together a great season. Tommy Mace, college pitcher out of Florida. Interesting season, but then you look at Tanner Bybee in the fifth round. You got Jack Leftwich in the seventh round. You got Will Dion, who was a pop-up out of nowhere in the ninth round. And then you go to 2020, and you look what they did in 2020. And this team in the 2020 draft, as my draft tracker loads, uh, let's see, Torque went 1-1, of course. Okay. Um, They went and got Tanner Burns, Logan Allen, and Mason Hickman three college pitchers. Yep. They've got a plan. They executed it perfectly. And Xavier Curry is a guy that I didn't even mention. He went in the 2019 draft. Yep. They're lining up sensationally for what's to come. They somehow buy low on these college guys. Like even Gavin Williams. I I, I remember like a one eight. Yeah. I remember when the draft happened and he goes to the guardians 23. I'm like, how, how do they pull this off again? Like that was one that when we did our draft recap, I, I was like, Oh, here we go. And he still somehow has exceeded my expectations, but it, it, you lay it all out. It's amazing what they do. 
I I agree with that approach, right? There's so many good college arms that you know end up being further in their development. You don't have to take as much risk on because you don't know what an 18 year old arm is going to turn into in two three years. You're finding out already. You get some of that concern. Some of that risk is gone when you're able to pick up a guy out of college, and even if he doesn't flash as much of the upside that some of these high school guys have, what we've learned is when you have the projectability, when you've shown flashes of what Gavin Williams flashed at the end of the year. You don't need as much track record. You can buy low on that guy and help develop him, and it's exactly what the Guardians said. They, they've just got Gavin Williams. If the college season, let's say if he had another college season after this, right? if he went back and pitched another year, he's, he's a surefire top 10 pick because he would have carved through the entire uh, SEC, or not SEC, mid-major, but he would have carved through the SEC if he played there too. Uh, it's ridiculous how they're able to identify these guys and pluck them just at the right time before they explode. And I think Gavin Williams is the latest example to get more into his stuff. 70 grade fastball sits 96 miles an hour. Uh, the slider is gross at 85 miles an hour. Those are two plus pitches are really better than plus pitches. Then he mixes in, or excuse me, the, the curveball is the 60 grade pitch. The slider is above average. And then he mixes in an above average changeup. but the fastball curveball combination is, is comical. The way those two pitches work off each other, riding up with 20 inches of induced vertical break does the heater, and then the curveball is a hammer off of it. And I think the slider is going to keep getting better as well. I'm also really impressed for how big of a power pitcher he is to have that feel for the changeup that he already has, and he mixed it in a good amount of the time, around 8 to 10%, which is all he needs. This guy's a pretty complete pitcher already, which is crazy to say. He is a pretty complete pitcher. Um, not only did he wear the quarterback wristband at East Carolina last year, which is sick, but I, I do want to push back in a moment like, yeah, great that they're they're great at identifying guys, okay? But they're also just taking like the best college pitchers in the country. Maybe they're not overthinking anything. Maybe they're like, yeah. hey, you know what? If you were incredibly successful at the college ranks, maybe you can be incredibly successful in professional baseball too. Yeah, no, I mean, it's, it's always what we talk about, right? It's the command over stuff, guys. I don't think Williams fits that mold though. No. So it's, it's, it's interesting. It's like guys that have just had success at the collegiate level – hey, why don't we just draft those guys and keep getting the most out of them? It's a pretty wild approach, huh? <laughs> Groundbreaking. But like the, the reason why I say that too is like they're never picking in the top 10 or they haven't in a while. Daniel Espino was the one exception of like going with the sky high ceiling prep guy. And that's worked Other, wonderfully. Yeah, I, they are so crazy. I don't, I, don't know, I don't even understand how to break it down honestly <laughs> i also think i also think people don't really like it doesn't register in, in many baseball fans that the cleveland guardians over the last 10 years have been one of the most consistently successful franchises in major league baseball especially when it comes to building just sustainably ingrown talent you know like a homegrown talent like none other i mean look at jose ramirez even that was a very low budget international free agent as well um it's it's really amazing what they've built there Checking in at 27, Logan O'Hoppy, Los Angeles Angels, traded over from the Philadelphia Phillies. And Logan O'Hoppy, I mean, th this guy has turned into one of the best catching prospects in baseball. I mean, 27th ranked prospect, period. But we talk about, and I'm going to kind of bring this point up again. Find me an issue with Logan O'Hoppy. You know, find me something that's wrong with his game. Above average defender, has gone nuclear offensively, always had the above average to plus field to hit, now is tapping into above average power, which he gets every ounce out of in game because of his ability to lift and the field to hit. Uh, this is a really well-rounded catcher that the only reason why the Philadelphia Phillies didn't hold on to him is that JT Real Muto guy, they were able to satisfy a much needed position with Brandon Marsh, who has looked really good with them as well. It looks yeah. like that's going to be one of those, you know, just very good trades for both sides, but the angels have their catcher of the future here in Logan O'Hoppy. And I think he's, he's big league ready. Yeah. I mean, he was the athletics minor league player of the year. Um, no, I mean, O'Hoppy walks a lot. Doesn't strike out, hits bombs, the occasional double, drives in runs, can swipe the occasional bag, uh, can hit for average, hits for power again. You're right. There, there's nothing wrong with his game. And don't you have him graded as the best defensive catcher in minor league baseball? Yeah. Or like of our top 100 list, yes. Yeah, of our top 100. Yeah. Damn, so, man. I mean, th this this dude's ridiculous. 87% zone contact. You mentioned the walks doesn't chase a lot, lifts the ball with success, above average pull side power. He's going to be a really good catcher for a long, long time. Not a bad dark horse rookie of the year candidate for next year either. No, and I think the question with, with Ohapi is not, is he going to bottom out? It's what's the ceiling?
right? Yeah. Is it is it limited or can he reach new heights? Because the floor is a right. an above average catcher who gives you a 750 OPS, yeah. like, which would automatically be a top 10 catcher in baseball with the way the position is. Although in a few years, that might not be the case. We talk about all the catching prospects that are making their way up. But at that at this juncture, being an above average defender with a 750 OPS as a catcher would be one of the best catchers in the game uh, with the way that position has been as of late. 26. 26. Drew Jones. I mean, this guy was so fun to watch. The very limited clips I could see. Son of Andrew Jones, of course. Outfield Arizona Diamondbacks. Probably going to win gold gloves, just like his father. Um, the bat, it's, I can't pretend that I can absolutely project this thing, but I could definitely see the raw power there. Was able to see some 106 exit velos that he put up in, you know, whatever showcase or whatever. Uh, which is really impressive still for a high school guy. 6'4", 180, but plus-plus run times. His reads and routes in the outfield are way ahead of his years. The swing is a little weird. Um, it definitely needs some refinement. We've talked about this, but at the same time, uh, good bat-to-ball skills. I have confidence that Drew Jones will iron out a little bit of the kinks in his swing. It's not like it's way out there with crazy moving parts. It's more about the path and efficiency. That's really the only thing with him. We're talking about an elite defensive center fielder with plus plus speed and plus raw power potentially. Uh, he's probably going to be pretty good. Yeah, I mean, only other question for me is is how does he heal and, and how yeah. quick does he heal? But yeah, it's kind of the same thing as Corbin Carroll, right? Yeah, it's the same exact injury as Corbin Carroll. Same exact injury. So I'm and not Josh Young concerned. and Josh Young. Okay, so we're uh, seeing a lot of good athletic players return pretty quickly from it and, and yeah. totally fine from it. So you know, I think it's a valid question. Um, but it does help that literally their top prospect, who's very similar in a lot of ways, had the same injury, recovered with that organization, and is good to go. So I think they're probably going to be drawing a lot of the Corbin Carroll recovery there uh, and, and applying that to Drew Jones, I feel like. I think so. I think so. And listen, man, I mean, you say good athletes recover quick. He's as good an athlete as we have on this list, I think. And I mean, ceiling is just, is sky high, but I wish I could say more about him, but didn't get a chance to see too much of him after he messed that shoulder up in BP. Hopefully he's back for the start of next season, which is the belief that he will be. And seeming with the, the recent track record of, of recoveries, seems like he will be. Taj Bradley at 25, uh, Tampa Bay Rays right-handed pitching prospect. Jack, we got to see him in Biloxi um, with the Tampa Bay Rays org. And, you know, he wasn't as sharp as he looked in most other starts that season. The slider wasn't there for him. Uh, but really from that start on was one of the best pitchers in the minor leagues, reached triple a, you know, made it to Durham at 21 years old. Fastball is electric uh, with life and he locates it. Well, sliders plus he has a split change that flashes above average, but he just struggles to command it, but he's a premium athlete on the mound. Yeah. I mean, he's high spin and, and a great slider. It's it's the modern mold and it is the Tampa mold and no Boz is going to hurt next year, but you've got Boz light here in yeah. Taj Bradley. I just said Boz light. Here. I heard, I, I, I heard, like I heard Buzz Lightyear. light here, basically Boz yeah. light here. Yes. You've got, you do, Boz you, literally, you do have Boz light with Taj Bradley, right? Because you are getting that explosive fastball. The slider is not as like sweepy and, and, Pitching ninja e, but it is sharp with late cut to it that just misses barrels, and it's still going to be just as effective, I think, especially off of his fastball. He repeats his delivery so well. The big, big question here is can that split change even be average consistency wise? If it is, with his command and, and his ability to repeat his mechanics and premium athlete on the mound and that fastball leading the way, he's going to be a really solid number two, number three starter for a long time. Tampa's doing the thing again. Yep, um, they do I that was, thing. I was really excited for McClanahan, Glasnow, Rasmussen, Boz. Now it'll be <laughs> McClanahan, Glasnow, Rasmussen, Bradley waiting for Boz in 2024. Silly. Absolutely silly. You didn't even mention Jeffrey Springs, who was somehow disgusting this year in age 30 season. <laughs> and then you got Pete Fairbanks closing games out. Yeah, this organization, man, there's something else. There's something else. 24. Marco Luciano, third base prospect, San Francisco Giants, was banged up all year. Um, finished strong, home run or grand slam in the postseason. Started to look a lot better. Uh, I was told by some that 
you know, that I do very much respect their opinions that, you know, maybe we, we should have a little bit more of a, a drop to Marco Luciano here, uh, given that there are some concerns. He's not going to stick at shortstop. We literally have him list, listed as a third baseman here, but he has a monster arm. I think he could be an above average defender at third. It's all about the bat. And we've seen him hit, put up exit velos as size 118 miles an hour. This was very much a banged up loss season for him as it was Luis Matos. But I mean, the bat is just phenomenal. Uh, the upside there. I think he made some huge improvements in the bat to ball department. Uh, he struggled in high A last year. I think really you know, improved with the chase rates, improved with the overall co- consistency of contact. The power is crazy. This guy has 30 plus home run upside with ease and an above average field to hit that should continue to get better. I just think there's too much offensive upside for him to not be a top 25 prospect. Bro, Pomares kind of stunk too this year. Oh, I, no. Relatively speaking, he kind of stunk. Um, no, he did. Yeah, I mean, this just had to be a lost year for the San Francisco Giants. From right? top to bottom. At the big league level, all the way down to Eugene, which we call the most talented minor league roster <laughs> ever assembled, and here they are. Like, who had a good year in the Giants system? Vaughn Casey, Brown, Schmidt. Casey, Casey Schmidt. Casey Schmidt. Schmidt. Yeah. It was Vaughn Brown and Casey Schmidt, and that's it. Carlos yeah. Rodon threw well for the big Kyle league. Harrison. Like Kyle Harrison. I forgot about Kyle Harrison. Yeah. But like, no, your point stands. A lot of the big, you know, and I made I did a whole podcast on this. I did a whole episode on this on the call of, of just the, how many guys in that system underperformed. How about Will Bednar? How about uh Mikulski? Like uh, all of these guys that you know, they've been really high on that we were really excited about that just just have not been able to do it uh as of late. I will say. I think Luciano did still finish strong, showed us some good flashes, showed us some of the ridiculous power and plenty of like 108s to 111 exit velos, which is just silly. The power is crazy. Um, I, I just think he's too talented. At 21 years old, with the bat speed that he's able to generate, it's Javi Baez-esque with better bat-to-ball skills. Um, I, I think he's going to have a monster year next year. I really do. Javi Baez with better bat-to-ball skills. Love that. And doesn't swing at every slider. 22% chase rate. <laughs> Someone did a compilation of Javi Baez whiffs that I really I did enjoy that a little bit. Maybe a little too much. 23, somebody who doesn't whiff much, somebody that we've been higher on for some time now. Colton Cowser, outfield prospect, Baltimore Orioles. Um, this guy just rakes, man. <laughs> it's just simple. He's a center fielder who is tall but moves well. Uh, he has long levers but stays short to the ball. He you know, hits the ball hard, but also can spray it all over the field. I'm a huge fan of this guy's game. I'm willing to bet a lot of money that he's an above average regular. And I think he just continues to get better and better before our eyes. Yeah. Uh, Kowser, not only did he complete the Lego Millennium Falcon, which was, Oh, he sick. finally finished it. Let's he go. Finished it, which was sick. Apparently he beat Gunner. They were, they were having like a little race. Um, but yeah, I, I think Kowser is a guy that has just surprised kind of everybody. And, um, I remember immediately after the the Kowser selection, my thought, and I will absolutely wear this one, was why would you underslot a top five pick when you <laughs> can go get somebody else? But yeah. uh, I, I think they ID'd somebody that they believe was very talented. They ID'd somebody in the second round that was very talented that they wanted to spend a bit more money on. And, and they did it very effectively with Kowser. And in this case, underslotting the fifth overall pick worked. And, and I think they really did believe – I really do believe that they believed that he was the best college bat in this draft. And it so far looks like he he very well might be, you know. And um, when I dug into it and I got the – you know, did the synergy dive and was looking at all the all the batted ball data and also just watching his at-bats, I'm like, what was it, Sam Houston State? So you're not seeing the best competition in the world, but even in the games where you did face good competition, I mean, catching up to fastballs as well as anybody. Uh, in in all of college baseball, just so direct to the ball. Bat lives in the zone. You'll get what he did against fastballs this year, 1,000 OPS. Uh, the only concern I have is left on left. He had struggles this year against lefties, a 616 OPS left on left, but I think he can continue to get better in that regard, and his strong approach will help him there. But above average exit velos, we saw him throw up a, a 113 this season. He has more room to fill out. He's an above average runner. I think he's got staying power in center, but if he moves to a corner, he's a plus defender out there. There's a lot of things to his game that remind me of Kyle Tucker. And, uh, you know, I don't think he'll quite reach the heights of Kyle Tucker, but I do think that there's a lot of similarities there uh, and a lot of things that he could draw and, and, and add, you know, a lot of value that Kyle Tucker does. I think there's, there's 
a lot of overlap there. I see it. That's it's kind of uncanny. I know you love your comps. I, I only throw them out when I really like them. You want more comps? I know you do. I will only throw them out when they're uncanny. That's an uncanny one. Dude, you need more comps, man. All right. Well, my, is, can sorry, you admit sorry. that my comps are not that terrible? Depends. I've heard some like a Bobby Miller like steak bowl. That was a pretty good comp. No, I not guess. a steak bowl. I'm talking meat and potatoes compared to acai bowls for Sandy. Right. Yeah, that no, was a great comp. Shut up. <laughs> All right, well, give me a comp for Pete Crow Armstrong here. This is like a classic easy guy to comp, I feel like. Andrew Jones. <laughs> <laughs> I hate you. I hate you. So what a year it was for Pete Crow Armstrong. Uh, outfield prospect Chicago Cubs. We just did the best tools in the top 100. I just put that out. Um, and I was really struggling So with who the best defender was in the top 100. So what I did as a cheat was I made best outfield defender and then best infield defender so that I could have Pete Crow Armstrong in his own area and then have, you know, Ezekiel Tovar in his own area yeah. with Bryce Turang. Yeah, Pete Crow Ezekiel Armstrong. Tovar in his own area with a friend. <laughs> yes, with yeah, with a friend. Um, yeah, that is a good point. Um, Pete Crow Armstrong is one of the best defensive outfield prospects I've, I've seen in some time. I mean, the amount of ground this guy covers – uh, the efficiency of his routes while he covers ground as fast as anybody we've seen. He's incredible. You'll see some of the videos uh, of, of some of the catches that he's made this year. We don't have minor league outs above average. I bet my life that he was like 20 outs above average. Like, he was so good out there. Beyond that, and that solidifies his floor, right? It, this guy could just flop as a hitter, and he's a fourth outfielder at the big league level because of how good he is with the glove and just with his routes in center. But how about the bat, Jack? How about the bat this year for Pete Crow Armstrong? That's good, man. <laughs> bat played. Uh, Pete Crow Armstrong unlocked a lot more power yes. than I think many people were expecting him to unlock. Um, he was good in the batting average department overall across low and high A, 101 games, hit 312, but he slugged 520. I was not expecting a 520 <laughs> slug from Pete Crow Armstrong. Uh, I think that was the thing that transformed him into a top 50 guy, let alone 22 in all of baseball. Um, yeah, his floor coming into this year was Ben Revere, like one of the <laughs> best defensive outfielders. And here we are talking about Ben Revere that can also hit. Yeah, Ben Revere is a great floor, actually. <laughs> um, it, but, you know, here's the thing. Like, he... he absolutely you hit the nail on the head tapped into way more power if you told me that peaker armstrong was going to flash a 110 mile per hour exit view a little no shot. Shot. slug 517 was well, it no shot yeah absolutely not 17 homers 10 triples 21 doubles he flies and you know the, the only concern i have for for pca at this point is approach um which is fine <laughs> uh he, he just he swings a lot uh it's 38 chase rate which is honestly insane because the fact that he was so good offensively while chasing at a near 40% clip is a testament to how good he is with the bat, right? I mean, he struck out 24% of the time in high A despite swinging at everything. Uh, this guy rakes. He's going to rein in the approach. He's going to figure that out and, and figure that side of things out. Uh, even if he's an average hitter, he's an everyday center fielder. I think he's an above average hitter. I think he's going to hit 20 home runs at the highest level. Um, the question is, how consistent is the bat to ball? You know, how consistent is he going to get on base? That's what's going to separate him between an above average regular, who's one of the best defenders in the outfield and a perennial all-star. And I think he's closer to the latter. Damn. I could see it. It's just crazy. Like talking about Pete Crow Armstrong as a center fielder of the future for the Cubs. When 365 days ago, we were talking about Brennan Davis as who has looked great by the way. Awesome. awesome. In the Arizona fall league. So where do you think Davis moves? Right. Yeah, I think, you know, for for a myriad of reasons, I think Davis plays, you know, right or left. Okay. Oh, no. <laughs> Where he's a probably premium defender, you know, just one of the best defenders at a corner spot, too. Tragic for the Chicago Cubs. Yeah. Last guy. Last one. Best one, technically speaking, right? Uh, 21 here. Marcelo Meyer. And I love that the way this works out, that the, the meyer Lawler stack – Ends up being two different episodes. So <laughs> Meyer at 21, shortstop prospect, Boston Red Sox. Talk about surprising power. I think we knew that Meyer had power potential. But, Jack, 
I was shocked at how much of the power he's already tapping into in terms of just batted ball data. Obviously, we haven't seen the home runs quite come. Uh, they will. He, he's putting the ball on the ground a little bit too much. But Marcelo Meyer, I mean, th- this was – we talk about all the different guys that had a, a, a point in time where they had a stake at the claim for number one overall pick in 2021. Meyer was the favorite at the end. Yeah. <laughs> right? He was the odds-on favorite, basically, to be the number one overall pick, and ultimately it wasn't him either. Uh, but this was seen as, you know, the most advanced – High school bat of the class. Uh, the swing is just beautiful. Uh, the, the, the projectability is there. There's so much to like here. And he's had a great start to his professional career. He has had a great start to his professional career. A couple of things that jump out. Played 91 games between low and high A um, in his age 19 season. So he hit 280, but with a 399 OBP. Excellent. 45 extra base hits. He had 30 doubles in 91 games, which was great. 13 pumps, but 17 for 17 in the stolen base. Department. Yeah. The speed's he's not, not a as, part of this game. No, he, he's not He's not as fast as Jordan Lawler. Stolen huh. bases are not going to be part of his game like Jordan Lawler. Um, but the fact that he can pick his spots perfectly over the yeah. course of an entire yeah. season, mighty impressive. Well, and, and I, I'm glad you brought that up because, you know, he does lack the the physical skill in some way. Or I would say not skill. I would say athleticism in some ways that, that Jordan Lawler has. Lawler's right? a way better athlete than Marcel. Yes. Meyer. But Meyer makes up for that. And this is not a slight of Lawler. Lawler is a smart player, too. But Meyer makes up for that with just really incredible instincts. You talk about the instincts on the base paths. How about the instincts at shortstop? He's not the most agile. He doesn't move – you know, incredibly well. He moves pretty well. His feet are, are pretty solid for a young guy. He's big, though, at 6'3". And his instincts are great. His reads are great. And that's why he's able to probably stick at the position. He doesn't have the freakish athleticism that some of these other guys have, and yet he's still able to cover ground. And you know, he reminds me a lot of, of, of Corey Seager. There, there's a lot of Corey Seager there for me because I really do believe in the hit tool. Um, I think the power is, is going to continue to come. And he's going to be a, du- a guy that hits a lot of doubles that by the end of the year, you're like, oh, shit, he hit 25, 30 home runs too. I know Seager's just now tapping into that power more consistently, but you know that was more of an approach thing for him. Meyer, the, the biggest thing with him, as like I said when we were leading in here, is more power than I thought. I mean, exit velos were really impressive. And how about the fact that he's such a controlled swing from the left side? He controls his body so well. Hit lefties really well in his first season. 296, 385, 519 against lefties. That's just a sign of a young hitter who knows himself, knows his body, very polished. He's going to climb quickly. The power is there. I really think the only question is the, is the glove and his instincts are good enough to be an average defender at short. This guy's going to be a really good shortstop for a long time for the Boston Red Sox. He's going to be an incredibly good shortstop. And, and the last thing I will say, because I remember talking about it on the Just Baseball show, what separates these two? Because, again, they're going to go hand in hand until they're both being inducted in Cooperstown, naturally. Um <laughs> But it'll be a question as to like who gets to go second with their induction speech. And, and you think both are going to Cooperstown, you psycho? <laughs> no. Um, the way that we kind of talked about it on the Just Baseball show was it's a WRC plus versus war comparison. Yeah. And at the end of their careers, I think Marcella Meyer is going to have a noticeably better WRC plus than Jordan Lawler. But Lawler will have a better war yes. than Marcelo Meyer. Correct. And we'll get into Lawler in the next episode on Monday in the final 20 here. Uh, but, you know, that's really what separated it. But Meyer has the skill set and, and the swing is so beautiful. And, and he's already so advanced in that regard to be one of the best offensive shortstops in the game uh, from the left side, especially once he gets up there. And he should climb relatively quickly. That'll do it for this episode. We got one more. It's the top 20 coming at you on Monday. Uh, hope you enjoyed it. If you could take a second to leave a rating on the podcast, we'd really appreciate that and help us grow this show. Subscribe to our YouTube if you're listening. If you are watching on YouTube, subscribe to the podcast so that you can listen on the go. That's it for me, Jack. Anything else from you as we brace for the top 20 on Monday? I don't think so. Enjoy your postseason ball, everybody. Yeah, uh, Tampa, Cleveland, get more eyes on that. It's going to be a ratings <laughs> nightmare, but damn, are we going to be on it? McClanahan ratings Denver. nightmare, but it's going to be absolutely a blast. Looking forward to that. And remember the top 100 is linked in the podcast description. Thank you as always. We will talk to you on Monday.